Thanks for joining us this morning. It's a real pleasure to uh, have Bruce Monson from the MPCA with us this morning. I was just saying to uh, Bruce, you know, I hadn't heard a whole lot about mercury in fish and, and the trends on that in quite a while. And so it's going to be great to hear um, what's been going on in that. Bruce has been with the MPCA since 2002, much of that work uh, looking at um, investigating causes of mercury contamination in fish and tracking trends in, in mercury contamination. He has uh, his PhD, I believe that's from the University of Minnesota, I think, Bruce, right? Yes, it is. Yeah. And uh, he was looking at the bioavailability of mercury in lower food webs in northern Minnesota lakes. And he also has an MS in ecology from the University of Illinois and a BS in zoology from the University of Minnesota. And since 2009, a lot of his work has been um, focused on PFAS in fish, but today he's going to be here telling us about mercury trends in fish. Bruce, great to have you with us. Uh, thanks, Mark. Um, there, uh, yeah, thanks for the introduction. And thanks to those of you who are tuned in. Um, you know, when Mark invited me to talk about this, I said I was gonna talk about mercury and fish and fish trends. Um, but when I, as I've been working on this over the last week, I realized I actually need to spend the first half of this talking about uh, mercury emissions and uh, deposition. And so here's the start out here, a couple of sort of primer slides on mercury. Um, this is a, a very, a nice simple exposure pathway that the EPA produced back in 2004, right when we were getting started on the statewide mercury TMDL. So I've used that. Um, and the only only modification is I pasted in a that center picture, a nice little uh, picture of a lake and the processes there uh, that was made by Scott Andre and later on. But um, anyway, this, it just shows you that, you know, simply that mercury is a uh, cross media uh, pollutant, you know, it goes from incineration of solids to the air, to the watershed, surface water, you know, the aquatic food web, and, you know, eventually into the fish, uh, which are eaten by humans and wildlife. And it, of course, has the neurotoxin, among other things, and especially affects uh, developing nervous systems. So, um, and back when we were talking about the statewide mercury TMDL and the development of that. I like to talk about use this to talk about how we to develop that. We really had to go the other way, go backwards and work our way to the sources to come up with our our goals for reduction. And then the other primer slide here is mercury species. Uh, a lot of people think of mercury as that elemental form, the the metallic form that at least for those people are probably over thirty or forty who maybe even played with it. You know, it was uh, in third. Uh, thermometers, thermostats, switches, you know, it's still in fluorescent lamps and still used in some products. But uh, as a gaseous form of uh, elemental mercury, it's pretty unreactive. And, and that's the form that most of the emissions uh, are in that form. And it allows it to be transported globally uh, because it's so unreactive. It, it is taken up by leaves of plants, you know, as in dry deposition, but otherwise it's pretty unreactive. And once it reacts to that middle form, the divalent form. Um, let's see here, do I have an arrow? I guess it's my other way through. Um, so right here we have the, the divalent form, uh, which is very soluble and, and that's what gets washed out in precipitation uh, that we measure in wet deposition. And some of that gets, you know, binds to particulates, but it's a relatively small amount. Uh, in the, once it's deposited in the watershed, you know, that divalent mercury can be reduced back to the elemental, which of course is can go up back up in the air uh, as a gaseous form. Um, and then most importantly, that uh, divalent mercury gets methylated to methyl mercury by anaerobic bacteria. And it's that methyl form that accumulates up through the food web. So as far as the uh, record of mercury over over time, you know, the anthropogenic contribution of mercury and the reason it's such a problem is that, you know, prior to the uh, industrial revolution here back around 1800, you know, the levels, these sediment cores here are showing the, these are lake sediment cores from Minnesota showing, you know, from 1000 up, up to uh, current period or 2000 here. And it shows that 
you know, prior to 1800, it was very stable. Uh, you know, there was there are natural sources of mercury. Uh, best known are the uh, volcano, volcanic emissions. And so there's this sort of background emission of mercury that's that's always been there. But then once the uh, thanks to the industrial revolution, we saw this huge increase uh, since then, and to a point where uh, although it started to come back down here in the 70s and 80s uh, in the Minnesota lakes, um, you know, it's three to four times the rate is three to four times what it was back at the baseline here. Now we don't actually have a good records of a long-term record that goes back to the pre-industrial area for fish. Uh, you know, I said in the title, this was the rise of fish. We, we, uh, we, we pretty much assume that that's the rise because every, we, have, we do have data that shows that it certainly rose in other uh, tissues. And, and in, in the Arctic, they have this, um, some hard tissues, they call them, of teeth, feather, uh, and hair. Yeah, going back to 1200, they've got some uh, human teeth measurements here, but that shows the baseline. And this is uh, the scale on this is uh, this proportion of the present baseline percentage. But it shows, you know, right again, when you hit, hit 1850 and going, going up here, the, all these concentrations in these various tissues uh, rapidly, um, you know, are increased up until the current period. So that's the bad news. Uh, the good news is that. Since we started reducing mercury and products and uh, putting on controls and air emissions, um, that we're actually seeing reductions in at least in the U.S. And, and in Europe. And this is a table that Hassan put together for the statewide implementation, statewide mercury TMDL implementation group, and it shows that you know relative to 2005. That in Minnesota up to in 2017, we've had a 54% reduction in mercury emissions. Um, and regionally, it's, you know, just putting the states around us and ourselves, it's been a 74% reduction. And nationally, it's been a 71% reduction during that period. Despite the, the global emission estimates, these are actually down here for 2010 and 2015, showing that there's been an increase over that period. So, so we made some progress, and, I, and then this over here on the right is a plot. Um, there was a paper that just recently came out. I'm going to be talking more about it later. But uh, Brigham et al. Uh, 2021 had some data for uh, U.S. and Canada emissions, um, and and that showed an 87 percent reduction from 1990 to uh, to 2018. And so I went back and just looked at our numbers and it was amazing that it matched that exactly uh, from 1990 to 2010, we've seen an 87% reduction in Minnesota as well. So, as I said, the, the global uh, inventory of emission inventory said that things were increasing, but there was a paper that came out here uh, in 2016 that uh, said there were some flaws with that emission inventory. And they said the three things that were wrong with it is that they didn't account for the decrease in mercury and products. They didn't uh, account for the reductions due to uh, mercury species or mercury being reduced from uh, uh, SO2 and NOx controls, and that they overestimated uh, the emissions from gold mining. And that's, you know, I won't get into that now, but artisanal gold mining, which is in small scale gold mining throughout the world, is actually one of the largest sources of mercury emitted to the environment not necessarily to the air, but based on their numbers, they actually said that there was a 30% um, decrease in elemental mercury uh, and a 20% decrease in total mercury. And these these uh, two figures here from North America and Europe of mercury, elemental mercury and air, you know, support that argument that is so showing a clear decline here from the mid nineties to uh, 2015. So good news, good stuff. and. This is a plot I've often shown. Um, that is our our wet deposition sites in Minnesota. We have four long term sites, and we also have another more recent site in in the metro area. But these four sites here have been work. Uh, they've been monitoring wet deposition since uh, the mid '90s, and you can see it here from uh, the Fernberg site up by Ely and the Marcel by Grand Rapids and Camp Ripley, and then down at Lamberton. That you know these top three are showing a downward slope uh, appear to be declining as we'd expect although just doing a normal 
statistical, you know, linear, linear regression, they're not, those slopes are not significantly different from zero. So they aren't significantly different based on the numbers that the Mercury Deposition Network provides. Um, and that's a network throughout the United States. Um, however, uh, the Brigham et al. group, that this recent paper in 2021, they uh, had a different method for calculating the numbers and accounting for changes in precipitation over time. You know, the two things that really affect that deposition are the mercury concentration in the water, in the precipitation, and then, of course, the precipitation volume. Uh, and when they recalculated it, they, you know, they, they showed this, um, it's not a linear regression, but they showed there was this uh, downward uh, slope in certainly early on, a clear downward slope at Marcel and at Fernberg, and then it sort of leveled off. And they used these uh, estimated values at the beginning uh, in 1998 and then at 2018 to look to come up with a, a reduction, percent change. And this is deposition up here. This is concentration in the lower here um, for, that, for that period. But anyway, the, I just wanted to show you how they came up with this and concluded that they're Overall, there's a has been a 22% reduction in mercury deposition in northern Minnesota. And then they compared that to these Voyagers National Park lakes. There were four lakes that they've been looking at for a long time here: Shupak, Brown, Perry, and Ryan. Um, in, in the right, right in this area here, and they were monitoring uh, young of the year yellow perch for quite a while. You can see here going back to 2000. And then more recently, they've switched to just looking to looking at dragonfly larvae, um, you know, in, in the sediments. And they've, and they've got a, uh, a good regression here between dragon down in the lower right here, the dragonfly larvae versus uh, yellow perch concentration shows a nice uh, positive correlation. So they use that to actually uh, estimate what the values were for the um, the yellow perch in the, in the last five years. But what I wanted to show you really was that, you know, this doesn't match what we saw in the, um, you know, in, in the deposition of the two sites that are nearby. Um, Perry sort of shows that, you know, it's, it's decreasing, but uh, Brown is not doing, it's, not, it's been fluctuating. And Ryan, which is one of the two lakes, Ryan and Tooth were two lakes uh, quite a while ago that were at, the highest mercury concentrations uh, in the state in Northern Pike. And interestingly here, it looks like based on these uh, extrapolations with dragonfly larvae that the concentrations have been going back up in Ryan Lake. So I got a couple slides here from a study we did, uh, it was published in 2011. There was a bunch of us that uh, from Minnesota and from other states that got together and compiled a large database that uh, referred to as MercNet, as well as Ontario. Uh, so it's the eight states here in, the, in, uh, in Ontario. It combined all the data on mercury. And on the left here, you can see um, the, the distribution of that data. That we, we chose two species to look at, um, to, to look at trends. We have the, the walleye, uh, and then we picked the, the largemouth bass. Those are the two species that are well distributed. And you can see the largemouth tend to be in more southern parts of that region, um, whereas the wall air up here. Northern Pike came in a close third, but we didn't use those. And then uh, on the right here, it just shows what we found. Um, there's sort of a key to this, but it's the M refers to MercNet, which is the state database. We, we decided to look at this using these uh, linear mixed effects model so we could tease out various things uh, that are affecting mercury, like uh, whether it's a lake or a reservoir, or if it's a uh, 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 fillet with skin on or skin off. If it, and we also looked at seasons and a number of other things. But just in general, what it showed was that there was, as we were hoping or expecting, that there was a downward, nice downward slope in the walleye from uh, the US and from the largemouth, as well as the walleye in Ontario and the largemouth in Ontario. Um, and one of the sort of interesting parts of this too is that we noticed there was a in the Ontario walleye, it seemed to be go actually going up uh, in the last 10 years. And when we applied a uh, two segment piecewise linear regression, it actually was significant, significant fit to that last uh, 20 years of data showing that there was a, a drop here around uh, the late 90s. 
So that was kind of interesting. Um, and then another thing about this data that's interesting is it showed us that uh, the mercury concentrations are higher at the higher latitudes. And on the right here, this is from the model. These are just diagnostic plots of latitude versus the mercury concentrations in the fish. So in the same format as previously, but it just shows you that the mercury concentrations as you go to higher latitudes are increasing in, in these species. Largemouth um, in Ontario was, was fairly restricted to a small area in the south there, so you don't see much change. But where we have a, a, a good distribution here, we see, see an increase. And then over on the left, um, we, these are plots where it's based on standard deviations from the mean. And so the red dots refer to sites that are uh, over two and a half standard deviations from the mean and the blue are two and a half standard deviations below the mean. And then we're, I mean, so we looked at both the standardized length, which I'll get to later what that is, but it's, you know, it's a, it's a way to compare all the lakes for a set size. And then, uh, and then the model bluffs are the, those are the best linear and un, uh, unbiased predictors, which are the basically the predicted values for those sites. So we have the two ways of looking at this. Both of them show that, you know, the higher concentrations of mercury in, in these, in, all, in both species in, in, uh, were in the northern latitudes. Okay, so I was going to talk about standardized uh, mercury and how we do the trends. Uh, this is just a plot. I was looking around for a uh, a good example of uh, a mercury versus length plot, and actually I recently put this one together, so I thought I'd use that. And it um, this is from the St. Louis River. It's you know it's uh, it includes the the lower part is the estuary. Middle refers to the uh, middle part of uh, where the reservoirs are in the St. Louis River, and then above that um, is the upper part. And you can just see here for the six species that we have that you know it varies uh, with year. And you can see we have quite a we have twenty years of data here, um, or over a period of twenty years. Uh, that it, it varies by by year and it varies by location, uh, depending on where you are. Even this is just within the same river, but of course if we had different lakes, it'd even be more striking. So that has to be taken into account and by standardizing the fish to a set size, it allows you to make a comparison among the location species and the year. So what we've been using, what I've been using for forever uh, are these, uh, are both Northern Pike and walleye. Um, the northern pike have been used for a long time, but going back to the 60s in, in Sweden, and as a, a they used a one kilogram northern pike, which turns out to be about 50 centimeters, and we've continued to use that in Minnesota. And then a 40 centimeter walleye has been shown to be pretty similar to a 50 centimeter northern pike. Um, and so that's what we've used. And I've actually combined the data for those two standardized uh, species. Um, and we have only, and we've also only been focusing on lakes for the trends because the data that we get from rivers are interesting, but we don't always know exactly where those fish were collected in a river because sometimes they can move quite a distance. And, uh, and so if you go from year to year, that gets pretty complicated and there's quite a bit of uncertainty. But anyway, on the right here, it does show you that uh, this is the log concentration of mercury in the two species because it, it is log normal. Um, Mercury is log normal, not log normally distributed. But if so, if you do it on a log basis, you can see that those two distributions are very nice, you know, look look the same for the two species. And so I actually combine those for the trend analysis. So back in uh, um, 2007, was it? I think it was. I was plotting up uh, 25 years of data that we had for these uh, northern pike and walleye, and was surprised to see that there was this shift in the mid 90s it looked like it was you know, i expected it to keep going down and the reason i actually started this was to, so we could come up with what our goals were for reductions which we expected to be about one percent per year or more and surprisingly it was going back up um, so when i applied a couple of different um, regression models to that i used a you know straightforward linear regression a quadratic and also a, this two-piece um, uh, segment uh, regression that piecewise regression where it selects where the check the change point is, it actually 
it turned out that that piecewise regression was the most was the best fit to the data based on this information criteria that we used. And uh, the quadratic was pretty good, but the the piecewise was slightly better. And so that predicted that you know there was this shift, a uh, trend reversal, in the concentrations of mercury, and it was right. The change point in the piecewise was happened to be 1992, whereas the quadratic was 95, something like that. But it was right around the mid 90s. Uh, and then, to sort of to support that or to test that, um, this is based on 845 lakes, 1700 plus, um, you know, lake year uh, matches. And, and so it's all these different lakes combined. So I, I looked at just with the changes within lakes uh, before and after 1995. And so they had to be, you know, at least two data points, at least five years apart. And what I found there was that um, before 1995, you know, the majority of the lakes were decreasing. And after 1995, the majority of the lakes were actually increasing. So that fits with what we were seeing with all the lakes combined. So what's causing this? Uh, you know, mercury deposition is the first suspect, right? That that's changing. Um, there, and we know that at the time when, you know, and back in 2009, when this was published, you know, mercury concentrations in China had been steadily rising. Uh, you know, we often talked about how China was building a new coal fire power plant every week or two, and they were using a lot of coal and that was putting a lot of elemental mercury up in the air. And, um, so we figured that could be a reason why they were suddenly starting to see an increase. But there's a lot of other little things that affect many factors that affect mercury um, by the time it gets to fish, you know, physical, chemical, and biological factors. And but those can be affected by climate. Um, you know, and whether it's increased precipitation, increased temperature, and the effects that that has on uh, water cycling. Um, you know, that all those those things can affect these some of these other factors within within the system. So uh, shortly after the published that trend reversal paper, um, we looked at we decided to try to see if we could see any difference among the lakes in northeastern Minnesota where we where, where a lot of these big changes occur. And so um, we we we, looked, we we selected 115 lakes in northeastern Minnesota, and we also and looked at the water chemistry and uh, those lakes that you know they had fish data where there was at least two years of data, and we tried to look at the trends, changes in those uh, the mercury concentrations in those fish, and then compare that to some sediment cores. Um, there were 20. 20, 20 of the lakes got sediment cores, plus there were some additional sediment cores from the uh, national parks around the area that we were able to compare at the same time period. And then we also went out and, and got water chemistry and uh, Chris Rolfus, uh, not Chris Rolfus, Chris Parson. Um, Parsons looked at uh, uh, the land cover for us and changes in land cover. And, and although it was, we had some great data that came out of that and it was some interesting results we weren't able to actually demonstrate that there was uh that the changes in the fish were a response to changes in mercury deposition or uh land cover or uh or water chemistry and a big part of that problem was that we just didn't really have a lot of data for the fish you know two point two or three points really wasn't enough to talk to real, identify if there was truly a trend so since then, uh, since 2009, I've started using this linear mix, mixed effects model for looking at trends, which I mentioned we used in the Great Lakes. Um, so I'd started using that before, but, uh, and here's the 2000, you know, I, the previous one was 1982 to uh, 2006. And that since then, since the shift was right around the mid nineties, I've plotted this up from 1990 to 2016. You, and this allows us to, uh, account for changes in latitude, um, you know, this different sites every year and uh, there may be some random changes in latitude. And as I pointed out, you get the higher concentrations of higher latitude. So and in case there's happens to be any systematic increase in the latitude of these sites, this, this is a way to adjust for that. Um, and what this just shows is, of course, it's, a, it's increasing, not as much as it showed back in uh, from uh, the earlier paper up to 2006, but it's there's still a you know 
about 0.4% increase, which is statistical on, with some tests and not with others, but it's, it, shows, it does show this increase. And after 2006, which is right here, we're seeing this increase, it, it actually started to go down. And I was uh, actually recalculating this every couple of years. And at this point realized, oh, that's kind of dumb because there's just so much year to year variability that uh, I decided I'm gonna make a rule. I'm only gonna do this every five years. So this goes up to 2016. So next year I intend to update this, this trend uh, line. One of the interesting things that comes out doing models is it does stuff you didn't expect. And uh, so this is the uh, predicted uh, results from the model for different latitudes. Um, and so these, these lines here are for the max, you know, min and max, and then the 25th, 75th percentiles, and then the, the um, average. So this, this matches what I just showed you for the regression. For the, for the mean. So it's pretty interesting. Not only do we see, uh, you know, the, the concentrations in the north are higher uh, in, in, in the, the standardized walleye northern pike. So they're not even higher, but the, but the rate of increase is greater than it is in the, in the, in the average concentration. And, if, and in fact, the, in the south, it appears based on these predictions, it's actually decreasing the, in southern Minnesota. So We'll have to see as time goes on here if indeed that's what we're seeing. Unfortunately, trying to do the regressions for each of these, um, you know, if I was to actually take the data, there's the, there isn't really an, a, enough data to get a really good regression uh, for each of these. But when they when you have this pooled data on the pooled variance, it allows you to to look at these uh, effects. So I just thought I'd run through a few other places where they've been seeing. Um, changes in, let's see here if I can get the name. Um, I can't see my upper right of my slide. That's why I'm trying to get rid of this block. But anyway, um, let's see if I can move this. It's not letting me touch it. Okay. Uh, so Ontario, you know, I, I, I'm very fond of Ontario because, uh, well, number one, they're our northern neighbor and to, they have 250,000 lakes and they like to look at northern pike and walleye just like I do uh, and they publish a lot uh, you know through the Ontario Ministry of Environment and Climate Change as well as a number of the universities around there so that so they provide lots of good stuff to look at and there's been three papers that really talked about the increases of mercury in the fish in Ontario uh, at least three there might be others but those three I, I recalled um, and this is one from uh, Gandhi from the 2014 study showing uh, the three species, walleye, pike, and lake trout. And so it's interesting this, you know, the northern Ontario, which is, you know, north of us, shows what I, what we found when we were looking at the Great Lakes region uh, for, just for Ontario. And it shows this little upward increase, but yet in the southern Ontario, it's going down. Uh, northern pike, which we didn't look at in our study before, looks similar. Uh, in the northern Ontario, but not so much in southern. And then in lake trout are actually very different. Uh, looks more like the predictions from our Minnesota model, where it shows in northern Ontario it's increasing, and then in, in southern Ontario, which I think is south of us uh, in terms of latitude, or at least equal to our southern uh, latitude, is actually going down. Whoops, no, it's not letting me change. There we go. Oh, and uh, going farther north, um, this is, you know, the point be being here that, you know, we, we all know that the effects of climate change are, are much more extreme in the northern, northern latitudes. But here uh, in the Great Slave Lake, which has been studied quite a bit, they, have, they had lake trout and burbot, and they showed that the, uh, between 1985 and um, 2012, I think it was, that the concentrations in the lake trout were increasing as well as in the burbot. And they found that the best correlate to that was actually air temperature, uh, which was rising in that area. And then I just thought I'd throw this in. This was a paper that um, Mike Meyer and others um, published in that 2011 um, 
Great Lakes study that we had. And there were there actually, I don't know if I mentioned this, there were two special issues that came out of that, um, you know, where people were looking at everything, you know, uh, air deposition, sediment cores, um, and a number of other things. And anyway, he, he has one from Northern Wisconsin where they showed, he actually found that there was this, uh, what he called biphasic trend of mercury concentrations in loons that look similar to what, of course, what I was seeing with uh, Northern Pike and Walleye about the same, around the same time. And he, this is the adults here and then chicks showing a similar pattern. So, uh, yeah, moving on to why, what we're seeing and what we can expect. I think this is some data from a study that we did. Um, well, we, we did a, a mercury loading study in the St. Louis River in 2013, and there was 11 or 12 sites that we looked at, um, both tributaries and within the St. Louis River. And that's the purple here, purple numbers. And then between 2014 and 2016, it's actually 2015, 2016, the two years we got loading data from some other rivers uh, in the Red River Basin, the Roseau and the Thief um, and uh, the Wild Rice and the Mastinka over here. And then we um, also, for what we got one year of data from the Vermilion at two sites and from the Kettle River at two sites. And so this, these are uh, yields. So it's a measure of annual mass loading, you know, divided by the drainage area. So it's per unit area of the watershed. But, you know, just what a point here showing you is that carbon, as we've, any of us working with mercury are very familiar with, carbon is very important to mercury because mercury and methylmercury bind to organic carbon and, and carbon is very responsible for transporting mercury. Um, and it, and it does other things as well, affecting methylation. But right here, it just shows you that this, there's a strong positive relationship between loading organic carbon and methylmercury, and that that can differ from one basin to the other, which I think we generally think that's because the, the quality of that organic matter uh, can differ uh, being, you know, some and in some areas it can more strongly bind to the organic carbon, which it appears to be the case in the Red River Basin. And there's been a lot of papers about climate change and mercury. Uh, you know, it, it, it continues um, in a number of studies, and, and some of those are pointing out that it um, that it uh, is responsible for some of these increases that we that we've seen, um, like this one down here about what's hot about mercury. Uh, and then the the UN, you know, uh, UN environment. Uh, in their global mercury assessment of 2018 really pointed that out too that climate change and as well as the processes within the that it's affecting within the uh, ecosystems that affect methylmercury are, are becoming very important in determining what we're seeing in in fish so uh trying to tease all this out one uh fairly recent paper here where they they looked at, they took a structural equation model, which are becoming increasingly popular um, because they allow you to separate out the indirect, indirect effects. Uh, and these are actually used, in some, in some cases, these are referred to as causal models uh, to actually tease out what is causing uh, various outcomes. And their original, in this paper, their original uh, conceptual model, you know, had climate and landscape were being the dominant uh, primary factors that were affecting the water chemistry and the fish size. And we all, we know, as I showed you before, fish size has a big effect on the fish mercury levels. What they ended up showing when they ran the structural equation model, where they used latitude as a proxy for climate, um, you know, is that actually had a big effect on, on disturbance here, on, on, on the land cover, land use. Uh, it also affected organic carbon. Uh, you know, and organic carbon, as I've said, is, it affects mercury, as, as we all already knew. Um, and then they, instead of using length, they used weight for the fish size here, but also, of course, that was a strong impact, had a strong factor. But so latitude can, can have a direct effect on mercury. It can affect the land cover, which can affect um, pH and DOC, which then in turn affects the mercury. So, you know, you realize it's, it's uh, Things as we continue to learn more, we continue to learn how things are more complicated than we originally imagined. 
And this is something I like to show, which uh, originally came out in 2010, uh, Wang et al, who's at the University of Winnipeg, had a title of a paper back then called, When Noise Becomes the Signal, uh, Chemical Contamination of Aquatic Ecosystems Under a Changing Climate. And, and more recently, they've had a paper which was uh, included in that global mercury assessment of 2018 in a chapter where they actually look, talked about this what's going on. Uh, and I think it's a great conceptual uh, model that seems to fit with what we've seen. You know, there was a period, of course, before 1850 where it was flat, there was natural background. And then as air, air here is up at the top here, increasing and then stabilized. And then um, for a long period, the concentrations we were seeing in the, in the fish, the biota were driven by the emissions. You know, there's a, a nice um, proportional increase with both but we, we've gotten we've built up the legacy mercury to a point here we've got this huge reservoir of, of legacy mercury in in our watersheds and our ecosystems that fish are no longer no longer appear to be responding to the emissions uh, you know they're, they're what they're being driven by the processes that are occurring within the watershed um, and i don't know if they really intended to do this but they're showing that it's increase, increasing amplitude over time here so eventually, as we uh, you know, decrease emissions, not only uh, mercury emissions, but also in, in their argument, you know, greenhouse gas emissions that we will see eventually see a reduction based on the uh, rate at which those emissions are decreased. And I just thought of uh, looking back at that plot I showed you before from 1990 to 2016, if I put it on a little different scale, it, it sort of accentuates the fact that like they showed this increasing amplitude uh, in theirs, which I think was just, I don't know if that was, like I say, intentional. It does, that's actually what we seem to be seeing in our year to year data for a standardized uh, walleye in Northern Pike is like amplitude from year to year seems to be increasing as well. So it'll be interesting to see in the next five years that this uh, continues. So, I, you know, there's actually two. Pretty straightforward conclusions from this, you know, the mismatch between mercury and air and fish is most likely, you know, due to climate climate factors and, uh, you know, which are affecting the processes that drive methylmercury levels. Um, but, you know, like I said, the, if we can, re, you know, we're not only going to have to reduce mercury emissions, but we're going to have to reduce greenhouse gases, it appears to actually see a significant decline in the mercury. Then my third point actually isn't something I covered, but I thought before I sign off here, I just wanted to mention it, and uh, maybe this is sort of a plug for a future um, talk because there's there's work going on in the St. Louis River right now, which is pertinent to this. But you know, there are these new scientific tools, stable isotopes, and uh, genomics. And in the case of genomics, they've identified the genes that in, in bacteria that actually are responsible for methylating mercury, and so that's led to some, a lot of research. So these. And then the mercury stable isotopes, as well as the stable isotopes of carbon and nitrogen combined, have provided a really a lot more, uh, really improved our understanding of what mercury is doing in the environment, where where it's coming from, you know. And it's also shown us that it's not making things any simpler. It's just showing us how complex the whole system is. And with that, I am done. Oh, that was great, Bruce. Thanks a lot for the talk. Hey, I, I have a quick question for you before people out there type in their questions or, or have questions to ask of you. Uh, you mentioned that the looking into the crystal ball darkly, that if we keep emissions low on mercury, they're expected to decrease over time going forward. I'm kind of I'm kind of curious what that's based on when mercury is so good at recycling in aquatic environments? I mean, does it eventually bind non-reversibly to different elements in aquatic systems to make it biologically unavailable? Or, you know, what's the long-term yeah. feed of that that would, would give you reason to think that, that it would decrease going forward? Yeah, yeah. Well, yeah, you're right. There is there's a lot of uh, churning that goes on, but you know the ultimate sink is is the sediments um, of lakes, you know, bottom of the ocean, you know that's that's where the ultimate sink will will be of of, of that mercury. 
So in freshwater, Did I answer your question. <laughs> so, so in freshwater systems, the the bacteria present there wouldn't just endlessly recycle it. It would eventually attenuate. Right. Right. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, I mean, only a, really a small fraction of that mercury is is available to the to the bacteria, you know, and, and they have a pretty limited area that they're active. So, as, of course, as it's buried, uh, they're not going to have access to a lot of that. If anyone else has any other questions, uh, yeah, feel free to type them in, in the chat box or. Uh, Maybe you can unmute, unmute and ask a question and uh, see if you can stump the chunk here. Yeah. Um, and if you have a couple of questions um, and comments in the chat. Um, so I don't know if uh, Bruce, can you see the chat? If you stop sharing I, your screen. Okay. You see, see, how do I stop? Here. Can I hit share and say stop? Uh, share content. Stop sharing. There it is. Oh. Yes. There we go. Okay. And where's the chat chat? If it's not open for you right away, it's on the bottom right. There's a little yeah. um Yeah, I got it now. Okay. Um, so the first one is just I think a kind of a general observation or comment by Andrea mm -hmm. about uh, TMDLs. And so I don't know if you wanted to you know, mention anything about that comment or not, but then we do have a question right below that. Um, is it uh, mercury value of total proficient? Well, it's it's the concentration of mercury of total mercury in the fillet. Um, uh, skin on fillet in those fish. I'm not, I think does that answer the question? So you're answering the question from um, Joshua Josh, that says Joshua, yeah. on mm -hmm. the mercury versus fish length plot is the mercury value a total per fish or a concentration per fish? Yeah, it's con I mean it is a concentration. It's um, you know parts per million or parts per billion. Um, in that case, in the standardized, I use parts per billion values. Um, uh, and then the next question is, could the higher concentrations at northern latitudes be related to carbon decomposition rates? Seeing the greater amplitude, are the fluctuations tied to precipitation temperature both? Yeah. Uh, well, you know, there's a lot of things. Uh, certainly temperature can be a big factor if fish are growing. You know, because of the cooler temperatures, fish aren't growing it as as quickly as they are in the south. That's certainly been shown. Um, the uh, you know, yeah, the fluctuations in, in precipitation. I'm not sure if there's differences in fluctuations. That's a good, that's sort of an interesting thing to that would be interesting to see if the fluctuations are are greater up there. I'm not aware of that, but you know, the just the uh, in terms of biology and the the, the lakes in in northern Minnesota, of course, are more dilute, um, and so there's there's probably you know relatively fewer fish within a lake, and you know there's this uh, bio dilution concept that the more biota you have in there, the less the concentration is because it's spread out over a larger mass of whether it's algae or zooplankton or fish, um, there'll be lower concentrations for a given amount that's being deposited or entering the lake. So there's that uh, dilute system, and then you know in northern Minnesota they also have a lot more uh, dissolved organic matter, dissolved organic carbon in the lakes, which can transport it because you know they have a lot more wetlands and forests that are decomposing that that carbon. As, as you said. Uh, was about using right. isotope. Um, oh. Yep, the next one was uh, they were wondering about using isotope geochemistry, and you touched at that on one of your last slides. Do you? Have any indication as to what use isotope analysis may give you? Yeah, well, that that is a, a whole another talk, uh, as I alluded to at the end there. Um, yeah, carbon nitrogen isotopes have been really useful uh, for telling us, you know, where in the trophic 
uh, which trophic level these organisms are in the food web, as well as uh, with carbon telling us what, where they're getting their food. And, uh, you know, in more recent years, they've been using these mercury stable isotopes, which are, can tell us, you know, if it's from an uh, uh, industrial source, uh, mercury or uh, atmospheric or from the watershed. And, and that's, you know, like I say, those, those isotopes are being used to really tease out what's going on with mercury in the St. Louis River right now. So that those are, are, are very valuable. Um, as far as other isotopes, um, there has been some work, you know, with sulfur isotopes as well, although that has not become very popular for, for using it for mercury. There's an article. Okay, okay. Great. Well, I'll look at the article. Uh, and then how much of a threat is extreme precipitation churning up the sediment and reintroducing the mercury? Um, I think, well, I don't know about churning it up to sediment uh, that, you know, certainly I, I suppose that could be a problem. I think most, most of the time we think about extreme precipitation as contributing to increased loading of uh, to the surface waters. So you're going to get more intense systems that are going to wash off, whether it's particulates is, you know, erosion, you're going to increase in that, but also you'll get more organic carbon, which is bound to that mercury, you know, mercury is bound to um, during extreme events. And then the fact that we're, you know, we're seeing these extreme events, but we're also seeing periods of uh, no precipitation. And so the fluctuations of wet to dry are much more intense. And that, and that has a big effect on the amount of mercury that's getting methylated in, in the wetlands on the watershed. And then over the course of this uh, variability, have the MDH fish consumption advisories been pretty much static or unchanged? Um, yes, <laughs> they have been pretty much unchanged. And then how much of the mercury is from local uh, versus global sources? Aha, uh -huh. who asked that question? Yes, well, we, we are- MPCA about... collab, it was MPCA collaboration too. <laughs> so it's a mystery <laughs> well, who that is. That may be someone who knows that we're reevaluating that right now. Um, <laughs> the, uh, yeah, the, the, what we have used, what we used in the statewide mercury TMDL uh, which was, you know, approved back in 2007, was based on sediment core work. And that, you know, based on the sediment core work, it showed that, um, you know, that uh, about 70% of the mercury was from anthropogenic sources. So there's 30% was that attributed for that background before the industrial era. And, um, and then sort of extrapolating from that, um, we have, you know, there's about 40% of that was regional, uh, rest 30% uh, global. And of that 40% that's regional, we figured about 10% was actually from, um, was from within the state. So in Minnesota, you know, the, we were saying 90% of the mercury is actually coming from outside the state, the mercury that's being deposited in our watersheds. And of course, that also works the other way that 90% of the mercury that we're emitting is going outside of the state. But, um, and more recently, we've been, we've been reevaluating that because there, as I was kind of showing there uh, with the Great Lakes work and then, and there's been other work uh, strongly indicating that local reductions, you know, in North America, uh, you know, in Canada, uh, in the U.S. have actually uh, shown that reduction, like I showed in the, in the Great Lakes, the fish have been going down uh, in general, and we've attributed that to the reductions uh, in in North America. We figure that's, and there's been other studies that have said the same thing. So we're trying, to, we're looking at various ways we can reevaluate that 90-10 split that we've often used. All right, and then I think the next question is, uh, I wonder. Um, if the shift you see in around 1992 related to recovery from acid rain and the onset of browning of the lakes, which would be greater in boreal um, northern ecosystems? Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I don't, I don't, as far as the acid rain, I mean, that, yes, it is, it's related to the acid rain. Some people think it's related to both of those things. I think it was just mentioned is that, um, you know, there's been a very 
uh, clear decline in uh, sulfate levels uh, because of the sulfur dioxide uh, controls. That, and so that has been very successful at reducing sulfur getting into our watersheds in the sulfate. Um, and consequently, I, you know, I, I think I mentioned, I didn't I meant to mention that, uh, you know, there's been some clear data showing that dissolved organic carbon or, or organic matter is increasing, has been increasing over the last 30 years, at least in, uh, in certainly in North America, as well as in Europe. And some have attributed that to climate change factors, but I think the more popular uh, or accepted idea is that it's actually a result of the reduced um, sulfate entering the system. Sulfur you know, the reductions in sulfur dioxide are, are, have led to uh, reduced sulfate, which has increased the solubility of that organic carbon in systems. And so it's producing more, they're producing more organic carbon, you know, it's in, getting into the system. And as I was saying, the organic carbon uh, uh, is has the mercury on it, so that could be, that could be a certainly could be a contributor. And then we have um, a request for you to explain more about how the change between wet and dry cycles affects mercury. Uh, well, what we think is that it's, um, you know, when it's wet, of course you're. Like say you say a typical wetland, um, it's the system goes anaerobic. The bacteria, the sulfate reducing bacteria, are churning out, doing really well, and using up the sulfate, turning it to sulfide, uh, and methylating mercury as they're doing this. And then as it dries out, as this, during a dry period, um, that sulfide gets oxidized back to sulfate. And so when it refloods again, the bacteria have a whole new supply of sulfate that they can use to, uh, to methylate mercury. And so that, that basic mechanism is what we think is really contributing a lot to, you know, to the uh, what, when there's water level fluctuations that can lead to higher methyl mercury production. Okay, and then we have one last um, question in here from Carl is that I understand that human consumption of mercury is harmful to neural tissue, especially for unborn and young children with developing nervous systems. Mm -hmm. Are there significant neural tissue behavioral or health implications for the predatory animals who carry the highest level levels due to bioaccumulation? Yes, yes, indeed. Um... Yeah, there have been ecological risk assessments um, done on for fish and also for loons. Um, and clearly with the loons, it was um, it could have a major impact on their nesting behavior at high mercury concentrations. So um, it didn't, you know, it didn't wasn't acute in the sense that it killed them, but it caused them to to not be as successful at nesting, whether it affected their behavior or other you know, physiological effects of the mercury. All right, well, it looks like um, Angela is in there chatting. I'm um, helping us all better understand the fish consumption advice. And then we've got a new question. Um, how does Ontario's fish consumption restrictions compare with Minnesota's? Uh, I don't know. Um, I, yeah, I actually don't, I don't, it's been a long time since I've looked at their actual fish consumption advice. So I, I can't answer. I don't know if there's anyone else here listening who could. Do we have anyone out there? I know we got lots of, uh, great expertise out in the audience. So if you, if you know the answer, please feel free to share. All right, well, um, that's something I guess we can all maybe go look for right after we get done here to see what is on <laughs> fish consumption. <laughs> right. 
Yeah. Bruce, that was a really interesting talk. Thanks for uh, Thank you. coming on with us and, and giving us that great update. I uh, really enjoyed hearing about that. So for, uh, for everyone out there, our next seminar is gonna be on March 25th. We're gonna hear from Seth Moore, who is the uh, chief wildlife biologist from the Grand Portage Indian Reservation. He's gonna be talking about environmental, social and climate justice applied ecosystem health research on the Grand Portage Indian Reservation. I can guarantee you a very interesting talk from Seth um, on the 25th. I think you'd really enjoy his talk. He's a great presenter, and I think he's going to have an interesting message to give us on the 25th. So I hope you can uh, join us at that time, and um, we'll pick it up from there. Bruce, thanks so much again. That was really yep. great. Thank you. Talk.